So let me start with a small example. Like in any other country, every year, sometimes more often, the Habsburg army organized a ceremony for the recruits where they took a oath. The recruits solemnly swore that they would support and defend the Habsburg constitution against all enemies and that they would obey the orders of the emperor according to the regulations and the uniform code of military justice. Please imagine such a scene in a huge barrack square of Vienna with hundreds of young recruits in a solemn atmosphere. The detail which interests us here is the language and religious confession aspect. We have detailed documentation on such celebrations, which tell us that in some cases they had to be handled in up to 10 languages and with the participation of military clergymen of seven different religious confessions. In the late Habsburg monarchy, 50 million people were speaking 11 different languages, not including, of course, their variants. Consequently, the central government in Vienna and the local governments in the crown lands had to deal with the problems arising from this multilingual situation and were expecting to guarantee the highest level of communication between the various nationalities. In such a context, the phenomenon of translation, beyond its genuine function of enabling or facilitating communication and cultural transfer, took on a major role in shaping the various cultures involved in the continuous interaction between these cultures. This assertion is in the very center of my lecture. I claim that in view of its multifaceted forms, translation and interpreting as practiced in the late, in the late Habsburg Empire to a high degree contributed to the construction of cultures in the Habsburg space. This claim is of course closely related to a post-colonial view of translation. The various translation practices adopted and practiced in daily life in ex-colonies and today's post-colonial societies to a large degree contributed and still contribute to the formation of post-colonial cultures. Okay. For our Habsburg context, a number of questions related to these, this hypothesis will be discussed in this lecture. What are the features which make up the construction of a Habsburg culture? And which culture concept do we need so that we are able to conceive of this cultural, poly, cultural plura, plurality? And which perspective of the other was created through translation, thus effectively determining the way of thinking in the reception culture? In what follows, I will try to discuss these questions in some detail. So this is the problem which I will just quit. Okay. In a first step, the Habsburg monarchy's pluricultural structure invites us to evoke the building of the Tower of Babel. As we know, the Tower of Babel metaphorically symbolizes the human trauma of not being able to communicate with other humans because they speak different languages. George Steiner locates in the myth of Babel a creative approach when he says, I quote, humanity has remained alive and inventive through the dispersion of languages. Accordingly, in history and presence, the language, confusion, the language confusion of Babel calls to mind intricate strategies of communication and requires characterizing the culturally and socially highly complex structure of the societies involved. A glance at the statistics of the monarchy's nationalities 
shows its Babelian cultural and linguistic diversity. The German-speaking and the Hungarian nationalities are the largest group, followed by Czechs, Polish, Ukrainians, Romanians, Croatians, Serbs, Slovaks, and Slovenes. Finally, the Italians and Latins. The census of 1910 gives us the figure of 51,350,000 inhabitants. A more detailed analysis of this diversity of cultures under the Habsburg umbrella and their location within the larger empire space requires the conceptualization of a dynamic notion of culture. Homi Baba, theorist of post-colonial and literary studies, helps us to locate culture within a view which could correspond to, the, to this plurality of cultures. He regards the product, production of symbols and meaning as a basis for the constitution of cultures, therefore viewing cultures as symbol forming and <clears throat> subject constituting interpellative practices. These practices permanently produce new meaning with an enduring potential for change and are open to the creation and adoption of new symbols. Homi Baba does not see subjects as acting ahistorically in roles ascribed to them within social conventions and traditions, but stresses the sphere where diverging ethnical, racial, and gendering ascriptions are transcended, thus producing the subject as a result of these interactions. In Baba's culture concept, the moment of encounter through migration is a central theorem which generates permanent discontinuities, fractures and differences and results in hybrid constellations. Hybridity may have become almost a trendy term today, but the concept bears a certain explosive force as its adoption in the words of Robert Young, results in questions about the ways in which contemporary thinking has broken absolutely with the racialist formulations of the past. Hybridity is seen as the product of contact moments of not only post-colonial cultural spaces, thus resulting in the transformation of all subjects involved. If hybridity is conceived of as the result of the encounter of various cultures, the concept of culture is experiencing an additional dynamization. This is shown by Edward Said when um, he states that the permanent creation and recreation of images which a culture makes of itself testifies to the manipulation and falsification, falsification of which every cultural process is constituted. Thus, Said not only foregrounds the powerful relations which are characteristic of any constitution of culture, but also the hybrid character inherent in any culture. He says, all cultures are hybrid, none is pure, none is constituted by a homogeneous tissue. The effects of hybridization processes can be observed at various social levels in the Habsburg Empire, where the moment of migration is particularly rele relevant, especially in the last 60 or 70 years of the empire's existence. Hybridization, however, can not only be attributed to the migration context, but is generally a feature of pluriethnic societies and is determined by numerous contact zones in everyday life, as will be shown. In what follows, I would like to give you a short historical overview on the monarchy in order to better contextualize the mechanisms underlying the construction of a Habsburg culture 
and also to better foreground the various forms of translation practice which will be discussed in this section. The monarchy developed from the Habsburg hereditary lands, mostly modern Austria and Slovenia, which the Habsburgs had accumulated since 1278. The Habsburg monarchy grew to European prominence in 1526, when Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, the younger brother of Charles V, who was also uh, the uh, Emperor of Spain, was elected King of Bohemia and Hungary. From this point, the monarchy grew to a size where at times it ruled over more than half of Europe. After the end of the Holy Roman Empire, at the beginning of the 19th century, the Habsburg Empire spent from present-day Italy to the Netherlands and from present-day Poland to the Balkans. Like in most European states, both liberalism and nationalism were on the rise, which resulted in the revolutions of 1848. The second half of the 19th century saw an increase in industrialization, which resulted in vast migration movements to the newly industrializing cities of the Austrian domain. Social upheaval led to an increased strife in ethnically mixed cities, leading to mass, to mass nationalist movements. In 1867, the Austrian-Hungarian Ausgleich or Compromise was created, which resulted in the separation of the empire. The Austrian half of the dual monarchy began to move towards constitutionalism which is important for the language policy I will talk about in a minute. However, the effectiveness of parliamentarism was hampered in particular by conflicts between parties representing different ethnic groups. In 1878, Austria-Hungary occupied Bosnia-Herzegovina, which had been cut off from the rest of the Ottoman Empire by the creation of new states in the Balkans. Nationalist strife increased during the decades until 1914. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the presumed heir of the Emperor in Sarajevo by a Serb nationalist group triggered World War I. The defeat of the Central Powers in 1918 resulted in the disintegration of Austria-Hungary. As can be seen in this short overview, migration seems to be a central issue in the economic and political functioning of the monarchy. Migration was practiced on different levels. On the one hand, large quantities of domestic servants and craftsmen migrated to the big cities in search of work. These population shifts are best documented in the population figures of Vienna. Between 1880 and 19, 1900, the population grew by 130 percent, while 20 years before, the rate of increase was only 25 percent. On the other hand, civil servants who were moved to a post somewhere in the vast area of the monarchy were also important carriers of transfer processes. Vienna, in particular, as the monarchy's capital, exported its political, social, and economic system, its legislation, education, music, and theater, and other cultural forms to the remotest places of its crown lands. Similar to other geographical spaces of the same period, the cultures in the monarchy were affected by decentered social, literary, philosophical, and other discourses which can also be attributed to polyglossia and the resulting varieties of contextualization. An example should illustrate this complex situation. Trieste, a city in today's northeastern part of Italy, was a crossing point for a number of ethnic groups. Italians, Germans, Slovenes, Jews, Greek, Armenians, Croatians, Serbs, Hungarians, and others 
especially since the beginning of the 18th century, to various degrees participated in the continuous development of the city and its harbor. This convivenza, the living together of the various cultures, however, was a political construct and can rather be characterized as imagined community in Benedict Anderson's sense. The Triestinians, consciously or unconsciously, avoided creating a homogeneous type of inhabitant and can instead be viewed as the effect of multiple encounters and contexts of diverse elements, which result in nothing more than rapprochement in approximation and in, so to say, hybrid subjects, the temporary result of cultural overlappings, the temporary product of the intersection of permanent transfer processes. At this point, the legitimate question might arise, what does all this have to do with translation? I would like to come back to the hypothesis I presented at the beginning of my talk, that is, that the translation phenomenon as practiced in the Habsburg monarchy contributed to a high degree to the construction of cultures in the Habsburg space. In the Habsburg context, cultural transfers were enabled mainly through plurilingualism, which was quite common in different social strata, as will be shown in a minute. It is evident that I'm talking here not only about translation in its traditional meaning of transference between languages, from a language A to a language B, but additionally adopting a metaphorical concept of translation which underlies and at the same time facilitates the multiple transformation processes enacted in the encounter of cultures. With reference to the practice of uh, pluricultural communication spaces like the Habsburg monarchy, this implies that the manifold cultural encounters in everyday life between subjects, symbols or cultural products bring about constructions which are negotiated according to the political or economic framework of these correlations. In order to shed light on the various transfer processes in the Habsburg monarchy, I will sketch a translation typology which ultimately will deliver details on translation practice in the monarchy and its main facets which make up the construction of the Habsburg culture. Methodologically, the typology will take the dynamic translation concept outlined earlier as a basis and claims to do justice to the complexity of the translation phenomena which can be reconstructed in the Habsburg monarchy. The different types of translation to which the various translation practices will be ascribed are not hierarchically structured, but should be seen as activity fields overlapping each other, and which at specific moments and in specific contexts can produce meaning with a high social relevance. Translators and interpreters are located within these fields and at the intersections of various social and cultural spaces. They are subject to the constraints inherent in these fields, while at the same time they contribute to their structuring. In what follows, I will distinguish between three types, polycultural communication, polycultural translation, and transcultural translation. Female cooks. With polycultural communication, I described those techniques of communication which used by which was used by which used by and multilingualism of great parts of Habsburg citizens as their basis for everyday communication. 
Usually, these techniques did not need an agency of mediation to, be, to produce this type of communication. Within this type, I would like to distinguish between habitualized and institutionalized translation. Habitualized translation is primarily practiced by domestic servants, craftsmen, grooms, midwives, mostly female cooks, and others. These people migrated to the big cities dating from the 60s of the 19th century. The reasons for their continuous change of cultural context and daily linguistic recontextualization were to be found in the varying social, professional, and personal environments in which they were living and working. Most of them came from rural areas of Bohemia, Upper Italy, and Hungary, and flocked to the urban centers, mostly Vienna, in search of work and a better life. Most descendants of these migrants were later completely assimilated and lost any relationship to their ancestors' origins. The countless Slavic names in the telephone directory of Vienna, however, prove that a high percentage of the Viennese population, more than a third, originate from migrants coming from the Czech and Slovakian territories. To sum up, the people who practiced habitualized translation were mostly asked to do so by forces dominant in the Habsburg society for the sake of handling um, all sort of everyday communication problems. Thus, these people were for the most part active in hierarchically inferior labor domains. What I called institutionalized translation was a type of translation carried out in order to handle the empire's multitude of, of languages in a way which was based on legislation and which required differentiated methods in order to balance or at least appease nationalistic claims enacted through language questions. Institutionalized translation was practiced in the army and in the domain of civil servants, that is, in central and local governments. The pluralistic composition of the Habsburg society was particularly uh, clearly reflected in the army. We can imagine the complexity of the problems arising from this multi-ethnic situation when we have a look at national statistics of the commissioned officers and the recruits in service in the Habsburg, um, uh, in the Habsburg army. Please see the handout um, you have in front of you. Uh, where you can compare the numbers of commissioned officers and of recruits in the years 1897 and 1910. Do you have a handout to somebody? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Now it's for Anthony. Are there some? Okay. Most regiments were composed of more than two nationalities of more than two nationalities, and there was a continuous shift between commando language, service language, and regiment language. As a rule, an officer had to shout his order first in German before he repeated it in the other languages used by the recruits in the specific regiment. In order to meet the requirements, yes? Yes, the regiments, the regiments were mixed. There was hardly any regiment with only one language. And Most was a deliberate method of trying to keep... Yes, and they had to do it, they wanted to do it in order exactly to meet the supranational army. The army had the claim to be supranational and not to be... Uh, let's say nationalized armies. So the languages spoken in the armies, which was the biggest problem I think which had to be settled because there were so many soldiers also serving in this army, was that at least two languages were spoken in all regiments and up to four and five languages was the rule. So we, can, we have to imagine um, that as a rule an officer 
had to shout his order first in German before he repeated it in the other languages used by the recruits in the specific regiment. In order to meet the requirements of this su supranational army, the techniques of language use were regulated in every detail, and the officers were given access to various materials, materials, materials to aid their translation, that is, brochures, terminology lists, and others. The type of institutionalized translation was also applied in the communication practice of the Habsburg civil service, civil servants. In the area of administration, the language question further nourished by increasing nationalist conflicts became a crucial one. There were several measures taken to counter the problems arising from these conflicts. One was to foster the criterion of multilingualism among civil servants, which had been traditionally adopted already for centuries. The demands made on the civil servants in terms of linguistic competence was very high. The Imperial Language Act of 1898, for instance, had decreed that each civil servant needs to have the language knowledge necessary for the service in the public authority he belongs to. Accordingly, the selection of the civil servants was done on the basis of so-called courses of competence. In Dalmatia, for example, a law from 1866 ruled that only those persons who could prove their proficient knowledge of Italian and Croatian in front of a specific commission would be eligible for higher posts in the civil service. Okay. Polycultural translation, the next type, comprises all forms of translation between the languages of the monarchy and which for their performance need an agency of mediation. In many cases, this translation was carried out with reference to texts, and interpreting too was a central activity of the public authorities. Within the discussion of this type of translation, we therefore come close to the traditional notion of translation and interpreting. Various laws in the wake of the 1848 revolutions decreed a smooth communication between the parties involved in public authorities, a task which involved an increasing adaption of adoption of translation and interpreting activities. In a study I carried out on sworn translators, it emerges that in the period between 1864 and 1918, 7,030 interpreters were active in 29 languages, which you see on your handout. I have the languages which were spoken and used in the Habsburg monarchy are in bold in this list. Just to give you uh, an idea of the quantity of uh, sworn translators which were working in the monarchy in these more or less 60 years. Okay. Here on this, uh, in this slide, we can see the ten mostly used languages of the sworn translators and the percentage of use of adoption of, uh, of the languages in their more or less daily practice. I will go back to this slide in order to continue with my uh, list. The sworn interpreters were supposed not only to possess knowledge of the monarchy's legal system and the content of the most important laws, but also be acquainted with the relevant terminology in the language or languages they were registered in. The standardization of legal terminology started already in the wake of the 1848 revolutions, which, among others, brought about the call for the legal establishment of equal rights for all the empire's nationalities. In 1849, a terminology commission was established with very renowned intellectuals of the time who sat together in Vienna for four months 
with the aim of elaborating a terminology of legal terms with comments and translation examples for the Slavic languages spoken in the monarchy. The outcome was quite astonishing, with one edition for the terminology in Czech and one collective edition for Serbian, Croatian and Slovene terminology. It is also worth mentioning that the work of the Terminology Commission was directly adopted by the newly established Bureau of Redaction of the Imperial Law Gazette, which was based in the Ministry of the Interior. This meant that after 1849, all laws, every single law which was approved by the Reichstag, had to be translated <coughs> into all the empire's languages <coughs> and had to be published the same day. Consequently, a large number of language experts, as they were called, were engaged as civil servants, servants in the ministry and were working on this huge translation project, some, some of them for decades. Now I come to the next translation type, which is already the last one. Transcultural translation comprises all translation activities which were involved in interactions with cultures outside the monarchy. It includes translation and interpreting in the narrow sense practiced in the diplomatic service and also in international business affairs. By far the biggest portion, however, concerns the translation of literary texts and specialized texts. According to my study, in the period under investigation, that is between 1848 and 1918, 3,100 translations were published in the monarchy from most European languages. The percentage of the various translations, of course, which you see here on these slides, also reflects the intensity of the contacts between the Habsburg monarchy and the other cultures involved. So you can see more or less the languages from which uh, the texts were translated and also that a big portion was translated by French, which mainly uh, can be ascribed to the literary translation. There was much translated from the French, as I suppose to many other countries, and Serbo-Croatian, which was a, tr a translation done mainly for political reasons, um, because Serbian Serbs were um, the, big, the, the, the most crucial nationalist group in the monarchy. So it is needless to say that also in these domains of translation, the attempts of sub subjects to, trans to negotiate translation and the social and cultural discourses which make up a translation and its performance are crucial elements in the process of culture construction. Transcultural translation introduces the other in sometimes conflicting acculturation processes, thus being an important factor in the imagined Habsburg community. By way of conclusion, I would like to point once again to the elements which make up the culture constructing character of the translation practicing practices. These elements can be associated with various factors in time and space. First, with the tensions resulting from nationalist conflicts in the last decade of the 19th century, these nationalist te tensions are inscribed in all of the types of, translations, uh, types of translation described above. Second, bi- and plurilingualism plays a major role in the construction of cultures. According to the territory in question and to the legislation in force, this bi- and plurilingualism, as has been shown, was at the very basis of the translation and interpreting activity. The third central factor was hardly touched upon here, that is, the lack of consciousness we could find in the vast field of administration with reference to the requirement 
of sufficient linguistic, cultural and mediating competence of the agents involved. Multilingual civil servants in particular contributed to the construction of a communication system which was often based on improvisation and ad hoc creativity. In addition, multilingual civil servants, despite all sorts of qualitative deficiencies, apparently made professional translating and interpreting a superfluous activity. Another reason for this might be that in particular to the, due to the enormous need for, ling for language and culture mediating activities, large parts of the population who required this sort of mediation tacitly agreed to get along in everyday life situations without the professional help of translators and interpreters. Also, the call for this professional help became louder over the years. It seems, therefore, that resorting to the colleague next door who had grown up in a plurilingual environment and who still had some command of the required language was too tempting. The culture constructing elements, uh, the culture constructing character of translation is therefore based upon a culture concept which takes into account the multiple processes of new cultural contextualizations and which result from cultural encounter. In the Habsburg context, this means that culture is created by the members of, of a society which, for various reasons and similar to post-colonial societies, transcend geographical, ethnical, linguistic, political and national borders. The agents involved as cultural mediators are located in key positions during the culture construction process which is enacted through translation. And as carriers of meanings, they are the main drive for changes in their environment. Consequently, the construction process in the Habsburg monarchy was enacted on two, two different levels. First, on a macro level, which was mainly conditioned by migration, and then on a micro level, where continuous translation activity, in the narrow sense, not only took into consideration heterogeneous cultural life worlds, but at the same time contributed to their creation. The reciprocal dialogical, polyphonic, and interactional interactionist character of translation outlined here helps to construct the receiving culture and at the same time can find context, contexts of reception through this contaminated existence, which gave rise to changeability, innovation and retransformation. In doing so, they allow us to see the Habsburg culture as a result of translation processes. Thank you.